All right, welcome to a sub day with Mr. Messner. We are going to be doing what we would normally be doing in class, only we have a sub here instead of me being there. So what are we going to be doing? We're going to go over our homework. We are going to quiz over the lesson from last class in your homework. And then we have another lesson and an activity in the lesson on getting good data. So let's go over the homework. I have a couple questions that I've picked out that I think are good questions for you guys to do. Let me uh, find them. Okay, we're going to start with 1.2C. So let me find the 1.2. Okay, this is a question that a couple people were asking during second period, making sure we understand this. 1.2C was about the Super Bowl people. Oh, really quick, go ahead and pass up your homework first. The sub will collect your homework. And then uh, that way, if you didn't do your homework, you're not just copying down the answers. We want you to have attempted the homework, and now we will go over specific problems uh, so that you're ready for the quiz. Uh, we'll go just through 1.2. Part A, what are the individuals? Individuals would be the football players here. And how many variables does the data set contain? It does contain the number, position, height, weight, birth date, experience, and college. I would consider the number being a variable. Uh, what would you think? And let's talk about whether the variables are categorical or numerical. I'd say the number is categorical. I would not think that we could uh, average the number and that to be a, uh, a very good piece of data. Position, same thing, categorical. Birth date, uh, I would actually think that the birth date is numerical. I would average the birth date together to find like the average age of all of my players. Uh, experience would be numerical. Uh, college would be categorical. Height and weight, of course, would be categorical. So, uh, sorry, numerical, numerical. So, categorical, categorical, numerical, 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 categorical. Okay. And in part C, what do you think are the units for each numerical variable? Uh, you might be confused, like, what do you mean by units? Well, like, height is probably in inches. Weight is probably in pounds. Experience is probably in years. Number is just number, there's no unit. Okay, so that's uh, the answer for A, B, and C. So remember the difference between categorical and numerical, um, and you'll be good to go. Next problem we want to do is 1.8 A and B. So let's go to 1.8. Whoa. Not want to do that. All right, populations and samples. Let me zoom in on this. You probably can't read this. Hope you can read the last problem. Too much. For each of the following sample situations, identify the population and the sample as exactly as possible. So A, it says a business school research wants to know what factors affect the survival and success of a small business, of small businesses. She selects a sample of 150 eating and drinking establishments from those listed in the yellow pages for a large city. Okay, so the researcher wants to know about the success of small businesses. That's all small businesses. That is your population. And what she does is she selects a sample of the 150 eating and drinking establishments. So that is probably the sample is the restaurants. Never spell restaurants. Restaurants. Okay, now to be more specific, she wants to know about the success of small businesses in general. So this would be small businesses in the country or in the world, just a small business. The sample are 150 food establishments in a specific city, the large city. Okay, so not just random 150, uh, but in a specific one, uh, one city. 
Okay, so population is everything. Part B, it was a little tricky. It says your local television station wonders if its viewers would rather watch a local college basketball team play or an NBA game scheduled at the same time. It announces that it will show the NBA game and receives 89 calls asking that it show the local game instead. So the population is the viewers, as everybody that could be watching the uh, basketball game, the NBA or the college. So total viewers, and then its sample would just be the 89 calls that it received, that it's it's getting that it's getting from uh, its viewers. So population is the viewers. The sample would be the 89 calls that you received. Not a great sample. It's a voluntary sample. You're not pulling uh, a random selection of your viewers, you're not pulling all of your viewers, you're just receiving 89 calls. So take that for what it's worth. Okay, let's talk about 1.9. This is a good question to talk about before our quiz. We have a truckload of apples arrives at an apple juice production plant. Plant's quality control team selects three large buckets of apples from various locations within the truck. Apples are inspected carefully. Based on inspection results, the entire truckload is either accepted or rejected by the plant. What is the population, the sample, the individuals, the variables in the set? Okay. Population. So we got inspectors who take three truck, uh, three buckets of apples from a truck of apples. The population would be all of the apples in the truck. I wouldn't say it's all the apples in the world because we're sampling from just the truck load of apples. So the sample would be the three buckets. The individuals, so where we're getting the data from, are the apples in the buckets. The variables is the, the data that we're getting from the apples. So what would be the data that we're collecting? Well, we're saying that based on inspection results, the entire truckload is either accepted or rejected. So why would it be accepted or rejected? Well, probably because of the quality of the apple. So you could consider like the color or the, um, you know, the feel of the apple, but we can just call it overall the quality of the apple. Okay. So make sure we're good with that one. Next one, let's go to 123. Angry bees, good question. Grandmother once told me that the color red makes bees angry. Here's a method I designed to test her claim. I'll select half of my students to wear red clothes and the other half wear white clothes. I'll turn a bunch of bees loose in the classroom. Record how many times each student is stuck. An observational study or an experiment? Well, you might think, oh, well, the person is observing how the bees are doing with the students. However, she is imposing a lot of uh, treatments and influences on things by forcing certain students to wear red, forcing certain students to wear white. She is the one releasing the bees instead of, uh, in a classroom, instead of just, you know, looking at a park and what's going on in a park or by a bee stand or whatever. I'm not even sure what a bee stand is. But would it be an observational study? It would definitely be an experiment. How do we know it's an experiment? Because of the influences or the treatments. What variables are recorded? Well, let's see. We're recording how many times each student is stung, so the stings. We also have, I guess, whether you were wearing red or white clothes. A student wearing red clothes are stung much more often than students wearing white. Can we conclude that the color red causes bees to get angry? Why, are we, why not? I'd say definitely no. 
we are talking about lots of variables going on in this situation. We are releasing bees inside a classroom. We are forcing certain students to wear red versus white. Locations could be, uh, you know, important for who gets stung. Could be how the students react. So too many other variables. Comment on any flaws you see with the methods. I see everything, all, all, all flaws. <laughs> everything is messed up in your experiment. Not good. Okay. So that's 123, and then we will get to 226. I want to make sure we're comfortable with. You know, we, we talked about observations versus experiments, populations versus samples. Let's talk about parameters versus statistics, so 226. Ketchup bottles. On Tuesday, the bottles of tomato ketchup filled in a plant were supposed to contain an average of 14 ounces of ketchup. Quality control inspectors sampled 50 bottles at random from the day's production. These bottles contain an average of 13.8 ounces of ketchup. Remember, from populations, we get numbers that are parameters, P's and P's. From samples, we will get statistics. So the population here is all of the tomato ketchup bottles, and we are told that in the plant that they contain an average of 14 ounces of ketchup. This 14 ounces has got to be your parameter. The bottles contain an average of 13.8 ounces of ketchup. That's got to be your statistic. That is the value that I got from... Um, my sample of 50 bottles, okay? All right, good start. Time to take our quiz. The sub will pass out the quiz to you guys. When you're done with the quiz, make sure you turn it into the top box if you're period one, the bottom box if you're period two, and then we will, uh, when uh, the sub's going to press pause right now, when we're done, when you're done, we'll press play, and we will start on the lesson. So you'll get your notebooks out, you'll be ready to take notes and to continue on with your study guide that you started last class. All right, we're done with our quiz. Our notebooks are out. We're ready to take some notes. So the next lesson is how do we get good data? So let's talk about getting good data. Here's a little cartoon where Lucy is talking to Schroeder. Lucy says, do you know there are over 80 million piano students in this country? And less than 1% of them ever make a real living at it. And Schroeder's like, where did you get those figures? And Lucy said, I just made them up. So not very great data coming out of Lucy. First thing to know is that good data is not based on anecdotes, OK? You are not going to be using anecdotal evidence when you're getting good data. It's going to come from many sources, many examples, and it should be non-partial, non-biased. Don't fall into the trap of using anecdotes. They appeal to our emotions. Okay, so good data, no anecdotes. Good data is compared fairly. So often a rate or a percentage is used when we're comparing data instead of just overall numbers. Here's a good example of that situation. We have two schools, both had 1,900 students pass the STAR, let's say the math algebra exam last year. One school has 2,000 students and the other school has 2,500 students. Did they perform equally as well? Well, they might come out and say, hey, 1,900 students passed, 
and you might say 1900 that's a big number but it's all about the comparison of the you know the number that you're looking for over the total to get a percentage of your students that have passed 1900 over 2000 is definitely going to be a bigger number than 1900 over 2500 therefore you would say this school did better Let's see what those values are. 95% of students passed here for the other one. Only 76% of students passed. Okay, so typically when we talk about uh, the data and we talk about numbers, we use percentages rather than overall numbers. I just want to fix this. Good data needs to be communicated and read carefully. I'm going to have you read this guy first. And I want you to see if something seems fishy about it. I'll read it for you as well. An advertisement for a home security system says, when you go on vacation, burglars go to work. According to FBI statistics, over 26% of home burglaries take place between Memorial Day and Labor Day. Beware, summertime is burglary time. What is wrong with that statement here? Okay, well, let's see. So 26% of home burglaries take place between Memorial Day and Labor Day. Okay, Memorial Day is like the end of May. Labor Day is the beginning of September. So we're talking about June, July, and August. Okay, so June, July, and August, 26% of home burglaries take place. Does that make sense? over like it seems like oh man we have to worry about summertime well this is three months out of a total of 12 months that is a fourth of the entire year well guess what out of a fourth of the year a fourth of the burglaries take place so if you want to say summertime is burglary time well turns out the entire year is burglary time as well so that statistic does not help, is not good, is uh, confusing to people who are reading it. Next one, let's see if you can figure out what's uh, interesting or fishy about this one. Only one in two cameras is actually in operation, but this could soon increase to as many as one in three. What is going on with that? My opinion is this word that is confusing. You think that one in two cameras is actually in operation. This could increase. I would think that, you know, more cameras would be in operation. Uh, this says that only to as many as one in three, that would be a decrease in the amount of cameras in operation. So this, this word is very confusing, this increase. I would say this is fishy. Next one. There's no longer Continental Airlines. However, it's United. Apparently, Continental, before it merged with United, once advertised that it decreased LOX baggage by 100% in the past six months. Is that fishy? I would say yes, definitely. Why is it fishy? Well, if you decrease LOX baggage by 100%, that means you are losing zero bags. That's what I would think, right? Is that true? Not for a big airline. Don't think that's true. Okay, so make sure our data is communicated read clearly. Here's another piece of data. Overall opinion of Nancy Pelosi and Dick Cheney. This is from a while ago. So from a Gallup poll, 
In 2009, it's taken with a 3% margin of error. We'll talk about margin of error more in the past, uh, more in the future. Can we conclude that more Americans have a favorable impression of Dick Cheney and Nancy Pelosi? Let's see, favorable is in dark green. Dick Cheney has a 37% favorable rating. Nancy Pelosi, 34%. However, we're talking about a 3% margin of error. That means this could be anywhere from 40 to 34, most likely. And this could be anywhere between 37 and 31. So can we say that uh, definitely Dick Cheney is having more favorable results than Nancy Pelosi? No, because the results can overlap. We could actually have a 37% favorable rating and a 34%. So definitely a no. Can we, what can we conclude from these graphs? We can probably conclude that people don't like Nancy Pelosi and Dick Cheney. Okay? About half of people don't like them. Good data is going to be valid, unbiased, and reliable. Valid means it's appropriate. It is data that makes sense. It is relevant to what we are trying to do. It's not just random. Unbiased means it is not consistently different from actuality. So if we are taking like a sample, we want our statistic to be similar to what we would find in our parameter. So if I want to see the average height of an American and I just take students from Lake Travis High School, or let's say I just take a sample of freshmen from Lake Travis High School, well, that's going to be a biased sample because freshmen, not all of them have grown uh, completely yet. They're from just a certain part of the country that is not going to be representative sample of the entire population, so that would be extremely biased. Okay, so we want our and uh, we want our statistics to be unbiased and then reliable. We want to make sure there is a little variation as possible. We'll talk about what helps reliability in a little bit. Okay, there is also an example we'll talk about more next class dealing with reliability and biasness. Okay. Now, you guys are going to do an activity. It is a how long is a minute activity. You're going to figure out how you, in this class period, whether it's period one or period two, how accurate you are at knowing how long a minute is. You and your partner, it's the same partners that you worked with last class, uh, the first class when we did the see here activity. You are going to use your phone as a stopwatch, and you will take turns timing and guessing. You're going to use your watch, and the timer will tell you. Uh, uh, so one person's going to be a timer, the other person's going to be the guesser. And everybody's going to do it three times. Okay? When the timer says start, you're going to start. The guesser needs to try in their brain to calculate how long a minute has passed. Okay? When the guesser feels like a minute has passed, the guesser is going to say stop. At that point, the timer will stop the stopwatch, and you will record the time that has passed to the nearest tenth of a second. Let's just go the nearest, sure, nearest tenth of a second. We can just go nearest second. Let's go nearest tenth of a second. You are not going to tell your partner how much time actually passed. You will reset the stopwatch, and you will switch roles, and you will continue timing and measuring until each person has been timed three times. After you are done with that, after you are done taking your time, you will go with your phone into my website, and we will record the data like we did on the first class period. You should be familiar with it now. You will go into Stats, Stats Lessons. You will click on How Long is a Minute? Make sure you are going to the correct tab. Make sure you're going to Messner 1 for first period. Make sure you go to Messner 2 for second period. And go ahead and, you know, next to student, 
you will write your three and people will write your three times and we will analyze the data after you're done so I'm going to give you about six minutes you know the sub will give you about uh, six minutes to ten minutes for you guys to pa uh, match up pair up go one at a time one person who has the timer says start the other person is trying to guess how long a minute has passed that person will say stop we'll record the actual time and we'll see how reliable our data is and how biased our data is okay so ready set here are the instructions again. Go do that. I will pause. Okay, hopefully we all understood what the pass, uh, the project was. All of this data is filled up. Now we can start analyzing our data. So I'm going to actually use Ms. Hall's classes uh, to analyze, okay? And these are all of her students classes okay so on average all of Miss Hall students thought that a minute was 58 seconds long which is not far off only two seconds off from an actual minute okay we can kind of see the histogram of the sample versus the actual minute and we see that we have some students who are way off it was a lot more popular to be way off uh, in terms of under than being way over, but on average, 58 seconds. So let's talk. Okay, so let's see. Analyzing how long is a minute. Was our data valid? That's the question. Was our data valid? Well, did we do it honestly? Did we just joke around because there's a sub here and we didn't really care? Or did we actually try to think of how long a minute it's going to take and figure out an actual guess? That would be the validity of our data. I can assume that some students in probably second period did not really care, did not do it, maybe just joked around, and all of a sudden the data is not valid. It depends. So maybe second period. No, that's just a guess. I believe in you guys. I'm going to say that definitely yes, the data is valid. Everybody took this seriously, even though there's a sub and there's Mr. Messner talking from a speaker. I say yes, you guys care. Excellent. All right, turns out 10,000 uh, people have done this test over the entire country so a good sample of the population and their average is 60 seconds almost on the dot very interesting so people across the entire country on average can be exactly on top of a minute as a class is our data biased and what could be a reason well, let's go back and look is our data biased? Well, we discovered that on average, Lake Travis students, at least Miss Hall students, thought that a minute lasted 58 seconds. So they were under what the $10,000 population kind of parameter came up with. So that means there is some biasness in our data sample. What could be a reason for this biasness? I don't know. You guys are young. You guys uh, are, you know, a little bit more active. Maybe your brains are just working quicker. Maybe you're a little bit more impatient because you are younger. You are high school students. Uh, maybe you think time moves quicker than it really does because you're high school students. That could be a reason behind the biasness compared to the entire population here in the United States. Uh, they say 60 seconds, they're a little bit more patient. You guys are younger, you're a little bit less patient. And th these are Ms. Hall students. I don't know, maybe my students were more patient with their averages uh, and with their minutes. But 
Overall, Ms. Halls are 58 seconds, so two seconds short of the actual minute. What else? Who was reliable? This is a good question. Who was uh, very, very on point with their uh, with their data? So it doesn't mean they were like at 60 seconds every time, every single time. That is what it means to be reliable. That means, you know, even though you might be off by a little bit, if you are consistent, that's a good thing. Because what we can do is just adjust you up, and all of a sudden you are consistent and you're, you are correct. That is, if your time is short every time. What would be causes of unreliability? Uh, not caring, right? If we don't care about this, uh, this activity, if we just think this is a sub day, I'm not going to do anything, well then maybe we're just, you know, saying, okay, stop after 15 seconds, or maybe we're waiting for like 70 or like 80 seconds, and then we're saying stop. You know, that would be a cause of unreli uh, unreliability for this data. So uh, I can't wait to see your data on Monday when I get back. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be watching it as the day goes along, even though I'm not here. All data varies, but we can use averages to improve reliability. So uh, no measuring process is perfectly reliable. Even you know, using rulers, we don't know if the ruler is reliable. But what we can do is take the average of several measurements of the same individual, and it's going to be more reliable. So we use averages a lot in this class. Be prepared to just say the answer is to use an average. Very, very important with statistics averages. We don't want to use just individual responses. Instead, we'll take the average of responses to get a better statistic. Uh, this is a good chart that shows what it means to be biased versus reliable. Okay, Reliable is consistent. If you can write down anything today, write this down. Reliability is really the same as variability. We're talking about consistency. Okay? The same thing every time. Now, bias is not necessarily consistent, but if we are you know, significantly away from the mean, and we're all away from the mean. So all the way from, we'll talk about our parameter. And whether that's because our sample is not reflective of our population, whether our sample is freshman students compared to a population of all high school students, whether our sample is I don't know, uh, a Texas duck relative to a, uh, a, a random duck in, in the United States. I don't know. There, there, there's all reasons why we could have bias. And these four charts show what it means to be bias reliable. This chart, we're trying to hit the data. This is maybe the middle is our parameter where we're trying to have our sample be right on top of us. We want our our sample average to be right where our parameters average is. This data is reliable because it's all consistent. However, it is off of the mark, so we would say this is reliable but biased. The second one, it seems that we have no bias. We are scattered around our parameter or like the spot that we want our sample to kind of show, but we are not reliable. Okay, so we're not biased because we're around our spot, but we are not reliable. So not biased, unbiased, but reliable. The next guy is missing the mark completely and is all over the place. So since you're missing the mark all to one side and you're all over the place, you are unbiased. Uh, sorry, you are biased and unreliable. And finally, we have a situation where we have our sample. 
that is right on top of where we want it to be, which is our parameter, and our sample is not scattered all over the place, this is un unbiased and reliable, which is what we want our samples to be. It's all about our samples versus our population, okay? With the middle of this dot being like the population's average uh, of whatever it is we are talking about. How do we achieve our goal? How do we get good data? We will use random sampling. Don't just sample freshman students. If we want to talk about all Lake Travis High School students, we should sample, uh, you know, random students in the high school, including seniors, juniors, freshmen. Make sure we cover uh, males and females. Make sure we have all, all, all students, you know, from students in AP classes to students who are who are not in AP classes. You know, we want to make sure we get a good slice of all students if we are trying to sample that population of all the students. Also to reduce variability or reliability. I don't know why we switch words from reliability to variability. I guess they, they really are the same. They could be used both. We will use a larger sample. The more of a population we get, the better our statistics going to be, the more accurate it's going to be at uh, you know, estimating a parameter. If I want to figure out the average weight of a student at Lake Travis High School, the more and more students I take, the more and more accurate it's going to be to the true average of if I took every single student and weighed them and then uh, found the average of that weight. Okay. Data should not be confounding. This is kind of like the coincidence. Just because two variables have a relationship, that doesn't mean one causes the other. There could be a confounding variable at play. This is like what causes the coincidence. The whole causation versus coincidence. Confounding variable is an additional variable that affects the response but isn't separated out. Confounding variables often uh, are most found in observational studies comparing a characteristics of two groups or poorly designed experiments. Sometimes the media ignores confounding variables and misinterprets results from observational studies reporting proven links when in statistics we only have shown evidence of relationship. Example of confounding variables at play are when we're talking about ice cream sales versus drownings. It can be shown that when ice cream sales increase, drownings increase. That does not mean we should stop eating ice cream. That doesn't make sense. This is not a causation. It is a confounding variable at play is, hey, when the temperatures rise, as the temperature goes up, there are more people swimming. When there are more people swimming, there are more drownings. When the temperature goes up, there are more ice cream sales. So it turns out this would be your confounding variable in this situation. Uh, this is some more data. I don't like these examples. I like my ice cream versus drownings example to talk about confounding variables, okay? That's it. Your homework is two things. It is a worksheet and it is homework problems from the book. The worksheet is both front and back, so you won't have space to put the um, stuff from the book on it. Uh, let me show you the book problems. You go into my website, of course, you go into the assignments, pops up the assignments page. So we have exercises like this, 139, 142, 156, and then 231, 32, and 45. You need to do that on a separate sheet of paper, and then you need to do this worksheet, which is the getting good data worksheet that the sub will pass out. I uh, hope you enjoyed this class. I hope we got good data. Very excited to see the results and to uh, talk to you guys on Wednesday. Wednesday we will have another quiz.
We'll do it all over again. Uh, thank you to the sub, whoever you are, for doing such a great job with my students. And uh, I hope my students were polite and nice and did what they were told. And if not, I will be very upset at them. Thank you.